time trip. It's a bit of a time trip and special. Go. We're going to go back in time for a bit of what I like to call the original Game of Thrones. Grounds of conflict. Cousins, aren't they? All cousins. Kissing cousins. Of various degrees. Oh, yeah. Kissing cousins. Oh, yeah. Every degree. They're kissing, they're fighting, they're squabbling. The crowned heads. Um, who are who? Who are these? These they? These cousins in conflict? Well, we're talking the crowned heads of Europe, who up until the First World War have a lot of sway over European diplomacy and military policy, etc. But yeah, we of course need to go back uh, to Queen Victoria, who married Prince Albert, very much raised in liberal Germanic traditions, uh, schooled at the University of Bonn and uh, really groomed to become a sort of quite influential constitutional monarch in Europe. Um, so that's how he ends up sort of with this marriage being uh, kind of arranged to Queen Victoria, even though he's seen as a bit of a poor relation. And this becomes uh, the beginning of a project, a political as well as personal project, as Queen Victoria and Prince Albert um, strategically marry off their progeny to crowned heads of Europe to form dynasties and uh, improve relations with other empires. And of course, this is a uh, part of the broth that uh, gets us to World War One. Quite a project it was too, because they had nine children themselves, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So mm -hmm. uh, no strangers to the matrimonial bed or wherever it might have been. And then 42 grandchildren a result of these um result of these nine children mm -hmm. so yeah full-time project really to be working out various relationships and intermarriages and how you can strengthen the royal line and strengthen the hold of the aristocracy over the european countries i suppose of course, yes and of course what we see is that these attempts to strengthen these royal lines do actually perhaps lead you could argue to some of the disaster that that befalls pretty much all of the crown heads of Europe by the end of World War One, except for um, Great Britain. Okay. Britain has had a civil war 100 odd years earlier that severely curbed the power of their monarch, whereas in Russia, they've had autocratic Romanov rule since like the 1600s. So it's the equivalent of like the Stuarts still being in power in Britain at this time. Um, so it's worth pointing out that um, the British monarch is most restrained almost in there in terms of absolute power. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. I didn't know you pronounced it uh, Romanov. I've always pronounced it Romanov, but yeah, horses for courses, I suppose. Well, I, I've always pronounced it Romanov, but then um, I watched a Lucy Wolsey documentary where she pronounced it Romanov, and now I can't help but assume that's correct and go Romanov. Is, is Rom Romanov, is that a bit of a... Just like Romanov in a Russian accent, slightly. Romanov. I think so, Rom yes. Romanov. The other Romanovs. We are the cheeky girls. <laughs> you are the cheeky boys. <laughs> As you say, autocratic rulers, they didn't really gauge the unhappiness of the country at the time. I think that was one of the big criticisms of Tsar Nicholas, um, is that he was just you know, quite happy living in his little palaces and doting on his family without really knowing what else was going on in his country and all the unrest and disturbance leading up to war, uh, the plight of the peasants and so on that ultimately resulted in his removal. But exactly. yeah, that, that we can get to. Um, yes, and it's, it's hard to look at his leg because his legacy, of course, in, has been um, like, re uh, no, yeah, carry on. I was just going to say that Queen Victoria's favourite granddaughter, one Alex of Hesse, Alexandra, and she fell in love with uh, Tsar Nicholas, Nicholas Romanov. Ro Romanov. How do, how do you say it? Romanov. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Victoria, she wasn't happy, for, happy with this. She was, uh, you know, a bit, bit upset because she didn't want to marry her favourite granddaughter, Alex, off to Nicholas because she thought the Russians were somewhat lower than the other royal houses. Uh, and, yeah, Granny was furious, but uh, actually Alex pushed pushed through this marriage. And uh, twice she, she turned down the advance of Romanov. 
Uh, but eventually she got Victoria's grudging approval. And then she marries him and becomes the Tsarina, um, the ill-fated Tsarina. But yeah, N Victoria was doing this all the time, like overseeing who married who and vetoing it if necessary or pushing the marriage onto, uh, onto her grandchildren and you know, really playing that matchmaker role. Exactly. And we, 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 if, we, if we go back to, well, Prince Albert's alive, um, so nine, nine children. The first and kind of favourites is uh, Vicky, Victoria, Princess Royal. She's seen as the cleverest, the smartest, the most likely to follow Prince Albert in his sort of um, uh, liberal ideas, improving a lot of the people, uh, science, arts, culture, trade, peace. This, these are sort of Albert's core philosophies. So, and she espouses those, but obviously she's born a girl, so doesn't inherit. Um, so she's the one he'll he'll go on to marry Frederick the Third of uh, of Prussia. So they'll have Kaiser Wilhelm, who will obviously come to Kaiser Wilhelm the Second, the famous one. Um, then, of course, eldest son and heir of Victoria and Albert, who we've talked a little bit about, but we'll touch more on in this episode, is King Edward the Seventh, who we've know succeeded his mum in 1901 after a long wait for the throne. Uh, Bertie, named after his father, King Edward the Seventh, he's married off to Denmark um, in what is a actually becomes a bit of a faux pas, I think, and annoys the Germans quite a lot. Um, so it's all very good for Albert and Victoria are trying to, like, manage these really difficult um, great power dynamics and all the great powers rubbing up against each other. And they're like, we can fix this by marrying our family into the other great powers because our family is so functional and, <laughs> like, on the level. Um, so if we just do that and just keep marrying and pro procreating with our own family, this will create the best leaders and thus do we end up with of course by the time of world war one kaiser wilhelm ii not seen as a great leader uh, by many king george v in retrospect seen as pretty good but pro probably his wife queen mary uh, they say was a, um had the level political head george was more of a sailor he used to eat breakfast with a parrot on his shoulder um so that's king george v and Tsar nicholas ii seen as completely useless Seen as a bit like a farmer, a bit of a turnip head. Um, yeah. Hold on, a parrot on his shoulder he was eating breakfast with. That's that's quite piratical, almost. Yeah. Not, not really a uh, traditional sailor. He's gone full pirate. Here is, here is, here is, here is, here is. You kings and queens in the 20th sea, once you've learned them all. Uh, George V wasn't expected to become king initially. It was uh, Prince Albert Victor, his older brother, known as Eddie, um, who, who died of flu. Um, and his wife, uh, his, uh, Queen Victoria had chosen Mary of Tech as a wife for Prince Albert Victor and future queen. Uh, and after Prince Albert Victor's death, she was married to George, who would become King George V. Um, I assume this Mary, Mary of Tech, had mm -hmm. all the latest gadgets and gizmos. <laughs> she was well up on her moving pictures and her newfangled ways of delivering telegrams, I expect. T Techie Mary. <laughs> she, I should say it's T-E-C-K. Um, tech, she was quite an interesting pick because she, she was picked from um, quite a poor, uh, sort of a, quite a poor element of the aristocracy. Um, I think Queen Victoria quite liked her sort of personality, and she obviously is formative in all of the royal machinations of the 20th century, um, even down to kind of coaching the Queen, being the Queen's grandmother. Also, a little fact I've heard about Queen Mary is that if you were sort of um, a stately home or whatever, and you, the Queen Mary wanted to come and visit, you'd have to basically hide all of your, like, valuable 
and beautiful items because anything she wanted she'd just point at and be like i want that and you'd have to just hand it like hand it over um because that's sort of yeah the kind of people we're dealing with <laughs> okay fair enough well lock up your uh your valuables when mary of tech is around yeah you know don't put the best cutlery on display or the finest trinkets because she might want them i i think who who did Princess Mary of Tech marry? That was Albert, was it? Uh, no, this is this is uh, George, King George the Fifth. George. So this is he's the son of uh, Edward the Seventh, also called Albert Bertie. Uh, and as uh, yeah, so George the Fifth, son of uh, King Edward the Seventh, Bertie, who was the son of an heir of Victoria and Albert. Uh, but King George the Fifth was the spare rather than the heir. His elder brother was Albert Victor who died of flu. Right, and Albert Victor was originally lined up to marry Mary of Tech, is that correct? That's right. And Queen but Victoria... He, he was rumoured to be gay, I think, so it, yes. um, it probably wasn't something that he wanted to do, but he, he realised that his his mum and dad had, had lined it all up and he had to do it, so he dutifully proposed. And then, if I'm following the threads correctly, tragedy strikes and he dies of influenza in 1892. And then Mary gets sort of uh pushed on to her brother his brother and yeah. she marries him instead exactly so yeah really determined they are to to get mary into the bloodline queen victoria never wanted to waste a good a good match um and yeah as you, there's a lot of sort of parental pushy parenting going on throughout all of this which doesn't really help matters uh, at all um of course, um, Vicky, Princess Royal, who marries into the German, the Prussian royal family, she marries a very liberal guy called Fritz. So Vicky and Fritz are quite united in wanting to influence um, the uh, influence the Germanic states towards as peaceful and giving workers more rights and doing the whole Prince Albert constitutional monarchy to avoid revolution uh, type blueprint. But of course. They have their son, Kais Wilhelm, who, and they try and inculcate these, inculcate these ideas into him. But you've got all these competing forces like Bismarck and his blood and iron stuff and his family within the, like militaristic figures within the Prussian royal family all trying to influence people that way. And this sort of wider conflict within Germany going on almost within Wilhelm himself. Um, and of course, it all sort of leads to, um, yeah, the, the militaristic autocrats largely taking power. Um, mm -hmm. but Bismarck mm -hmm. is a figure, I think, who doesn't come under enough scrutiny for for causing World War One. Probably, he he bears a lot more responsibility than the Kaiser in a way. In a way, you could argue. Well, he was the one who was really like the founding father of uniting Germany. Um, greater Germany and pulling all the pieces together and then building up the armed forces and uh, promoting nationalism and empire and everything. I have a feeling Kaiser Wilhelm, he was just all, along for the ride, more or less. He he liked the idea of all of this, but I don't quite believe he would have had the nous or wherewithal to to organise Germany from like this federated uh, a conglomeration of various states and pull them all together by himself like Bismarck essentially did and then to, to run away with it and, and turn well, Germany into a military superpower. Exactly and then of course um, he sacks Bismarck eventually and this is after years of conflict to, between Wiley Bismarck and the Kaiser and his father so then you lose even uh, the kind of statesman because Kaiser Wilhelm is a really bad statesman He's just ruled by emotional outbursts a lot of the time um, and likes dressing up in uniforms. They all like dressing up in uniforms, so it's unfair to... And up until the First World War, one of the things the whole family does is they all go off to, you know, to Russia or Germany or England and they all wear the uniforms of the country that they've come to and, um, you know, are all exhibited and paraded around. You don't get that when we get to the First World War. Indeed, of course, as we'll discover, it becomes a massive liability for all of them that they have these, like, close familial ties with all the other great powers. It yeah, I like this, this uniform swapping. There are some 
uh, famous <laughs> pictures, I think, from uh, 1912, <coughs> a marriage in 1912. One of the royal family members is getting married to someone else, and they all come together in 1912 or perhaps it's 1913, whatever. Just like if, a year or so before war, you get this last collection of all these monarchs from the family of Queen Victoria. And yeah, they're all uniform swapping and uh, dressing up in each other's uniform, which is a little <laughs> bit confusing. But uh, I think what they do is they give like honorary titles within the army to each other. So yeah, yeah. Nicholas gets a, an honorary title in the German army and vice versa. Uh, Wilhelm gets an honorary title in the Russian or British army. And so they've got a selection of uniforms that are not their own nationality that they can choose from. Uh, so yeah, for any uniform buffs out there, very interesting. It's very edifying to witness, and of course, still goes on today. And they still give each other titles today in the old royal family. Um, but yeah, not on a pan European I, basis. I think it is interesting, though, when you look at these three characters you've got Wilhelm from Germany, uh, you've got the Tsar Nicholas from Russia, and then you've got George, King of England. They they all sort of grew up together in some extent. They all spent time with each other as youths and at these family gatherings. And they were all uh, like conditioned to the fact that they would at one day take over the throne. Maybe less George, because as we said, his brother was meant to be it. And then he was sort of thrust into it. Um, and it's interesting to see how their personalities develop uh, between each other as well. Because mm. George and Nicholas, they were very close. Partly, I think, because their mothers were sisters. Uh, you had Alexandra of Denmark and Dagmar of Denmark, uh, who were their mothers, and, and they both married into this royal bloodline. Uh, and that's why they look so alike, George V and Tsar Nicholas, uh, because of the bloodline on their mother's side. Uh, so, yeah, they, they were spending a lot of families together in Denmark and listening to the same tales from mother and auntie. And Wilhelm, I feel like he wanted perhaps to be a part of this, but was excluded a little bit. Uh, and was looked down on as the uh, the weird German cousin. <laughs> he had an enduring uh, hatred almost of the British because his mother was British, uh, Victoria, uh, Vicky Jr., J.R. Uh, but when giving birth to Wilhelm, there was some problem. Yes, and it was like he a... had to be like dragged out and was brutally grabbed by the arm and Terribly almost handled, ripped from the, room, from the womb. Mm. And... He blamed his mother, but also British doctors. Um, yeah, because well, uh, she insisted on a, an English doctor performing the um, the surgery. So, because there was, as you say, the slight snobbery. Wilhelm didn't really like Britain that much, and he hated his uncle. I think. Yes, Uncle Bertie. Um, and Uncle Absolutely. Bertie likewise hated him, but he he called Uncle Bertie uh, Satan. Yeah, at um, some point in his memoirs, Uncle Bertie was a smoking drinking, philandering, liberal playboy who was very popular, which was the main cause, I think, of Wilhelm being very jealous of him. Uh, very popular during his kingship, I should say, 1901 to 1910, um, like helps restore diplomatic relations with France and forms the basis of the Entente Cordiale. Um, but yeah, exactly, there's a strong psychological urge. I, I should say as well, going back to difficult breach birth and... Than the fact that he has um, a brachial, I forget what the technical term is, but yeah, his left arm, he has a lot of uh, difficulty with. Um, the problem is, is that it's sort of like a big thing in the history of Prussian princes that you should be very masculine um, and that you should be able to ride horses. So this guy, this kid who's got really poor use of his left arm is just basically like put on horses as like a six year old and forced to just like ride falling off endlessly and endlessly and just pushed into it. So that's going to have a huge effect. He also there's this whole like intrigue over again, Vicky and Fritz, his parents wanting to tutor him in, in more modern, enlightened ways. But then like um, his tutor actually being a really militaristic Prussian guy who's able to influence him that way and all, all sorts of intrigue going on um, in that court. But he didn't sound like a lot of fun, the, the, the Kaiser. And he was very good at just defending everyone wherever he, he went, I believe. Mm. Yeah, I, I get this impression that the Kaiser is a little bit of a weirdo. Um, 
They're Partly all weirdos. Bit, well, yeah, maybe not a little bit. Perhaps he's the biggest weirdo of the bunch. Um, I think partly it's uh, down to wanting to prove himself, and he he seems to have a nature uh, inherent in his personality where he has to go out and like do bigger and better things, and like has to make the German Navy better than the British Navy, and he has to have a better empire than the of British. Of course, empire. Johnny. Ha- however, like it's it's slight. I'm not. I'm. I think he was quite bad, but it's some of this. I feel is just how. Oh, innate British perspective, because, of course, if you think of our time trips from 1901 to 1910, like, all all the powers are doing that, like, winding each other up, nicking bits of land, like, it's, a, it's just like a complete... So you can sort of see why, I think, you know, why that German Empire is able to form there. It's because it's kind of these, yeah, forming power blocks. Like, I feel like... It's kind of unfair to just go for Kaiser Wilhelm. Um, gender dynamics are a huge factor in all of these relationships, from Albert and Victoria to uh, Fritz, Wilhelm's father being seen by the Prussian establishment as a bit of a kind of, uh, what's a better word for whipped? But that's how they saw it. They saw him as whipped. And they incul- and Kaiser Wilhelm ended up with this image of his mother as this controlling figure and his father just, like, took her chisel and, you know, this should be a, a kind of masculine Prussian um, affair. Mm. It's, um... Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, v- Vicky Jr., as, I, as I've termed her, she was the one who wore the trousers, so to speak, then, in the uh in the relationship um, with Fritz. I, I, I don't think Fritz that's was quite almost true. in thrall to her is what you're saying no that was the that was the sort of propaganda image and I don't think that is actually quite true but it's it's of course don't forget it comes from the fact that Vicky is like a w- quite well educated woman because Prince Albert believes in in educating them so it's just quite interesting that she's a sort of product of that liberal thing and then that d- doesn't go down well in this increasingly male-dominated, militaristic, Bismarckian, expanding Prussian Empire. Well, I'm glad we've got on to the subject of Vicky and her relationship with Wilhelm, because that mm. was going to be the, the main thrust of my argument of why Wilhelm was the biggest weirdo of the bunch, <laughs> because he, he had a very strange relationship with his mother. Uh He's only human. It develops as a teenager, and he's writing her lots of these uh, odd letters, and they almost seem like sexually charged. And he's describing his dreams of kissing her hands and caressing her, and it's almost like a, a cry for attention. Have you got any of them up? Are you sure? Are they are you sure sexually charged? I mean, it seems that I've got one quote here, and it says uh, from Wilhelm to his mother, uh, where he's writing this letter to her. Promise to do to me as I did in my dream to you. I love you so much. So yeah, a little, little odd. And then she replies to the letter. She just like ignoring it. She's like, okay, weirdo, weirdo son. And this what? just uh, <laughs> this sort of it caused their relationship to deteriorate a little yeah, bit. I think, I, I, I she's like... only talking about art and politics, and he's telling her of his uh... dreams and caressing and kissing her. And yeah, not, not, not quite. But, above board, I I'm not, say. but that does sound a bit like just the style of like that's sort of how Victoria and her kids write to each other. Is so, w- would would it be fair to say that it sounds more like the classic Victoria and Albert emotionally distant parenting is the issue here, and Vic, Vicky kind of put, uh, that almost going through uh, Vicky, who can't really emotionally connect with her son when he needs it. She can only talk of politics and stuff. This uh, forms into a resentment within Wilhelm's head. It grows, it grows, it grows. Bismarck and all the others exacerbate this. Big trend, as I've said, is the politicians and emerging big thinkers of the time um, using the, shall we say, slightly thick crown heads uh, for their own purposes. So lots of puppet work going on. Um, Mm. And of yes puppet work.
Britain obviously had imported that German royal family as the next um, next in line who weren't Catholic. Um, so they imported the Hanoverians, George's one to four. Then you get William the fourth, uh, brother of George the fourth. Then Queen Victoria is his niece. So they are, as you say, German already. So, so a lot of sort of pretending to be one thing and not the other, which as you're probably coming, coming to, comes to a head during World War I for all of them. Um, I mean, nipping back to Russia very quickly, um, there's a bit of a problem. We'll, we'll obviously do the Romanov escape in more detail when we come to that episode, I imagine. Um, but one of the big reasons that um, George V and the British government end up refusing to save Tsar Nicholas II and his family from the Bolshevik bullets um, is that the idea of sheltering not just a sort of... Um, Tsar with a bad reputation, but also his German wife is unthinkable. Um, so Britain cannot accept them. Um, and of course, during the First World War, this is when the, the royal name in Britain of Saxe, Coburg und Gotha becomes very unfashionable. And they have a little PR brainstorm and take on the name of Windsor as a much more English name than Saxe, Coburg und Gotha. And so in 1917, Kaiser Wilhelm is sort of bemused and very angry to discover that they've thrown off their uh, German Prince Albert roots um, to uh, sweep it under the rug, as the famous cartoon would have it, George V sweeping his Germanic roots under the rug. <laughs> Uh, we talked about how there's a lot of competition between these cousins. I get the feeling that yeah, Kaiser wants to be the the big dog in the kennel. Uh, George V probably is at this time the big dog on the continent because he's he's simply king of England and and has yeah, the most powerful navy, pretty strong army, and a big empire. And then you've got Nicholas, who has a long history and uh, presides over the largest country. But because it's fought a war uh, with Japan in 1905, which went very badly, uh, sorry, no, 1901 or two in, with Japan, and then it had a sort of mini revolution in 1905, they're sort of almost bankrupt by this point on the outbreak of war. Even though they're still living their extravagant life, they don't really see the writing on the wall that Russia is a tinder keg. And then, yeah, you've got the spark of Archduke Franz Ferdinand being assassinated. And this is where relations between Nicholas of Russia and Wilhelm of Germany, they really deteriorate as both of them are like telegramming each other. Uh, the Mary of Tech, she'd be very proud that they're using such modern technology to keep in touch with each other and try to avert war, but it's ultimately useless because uh, although they're saying to each other, "Yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to uh, like launch conscription. We're going to stand down the mobilisation of armies. Uh, we're going to do our best to avoid it." Oh, beloved Nicky, oh, beloved Willie, little Willie, he was called by uh, by Queen Victoria. <laughs> uh, probably didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> in, in making him come across. What's he called? Uh, what's he really called? Little Willie. Willie, yes. <laughs> uh, didn't help him in his uh, ambitions to be on a, on a par with his bigger cousins. Uh, anyway, yeah, they're, they're frantically trying Boring. to avert war, but maybe not really wanting to avert war. I have a feeling particularly the Kaiser sees war as almost inevitable, and he's driven as well by his statesmen to say, well, don't do that. Don't dismobilise our forces. We're going to push and we're going to expand and conquer and crush. And by this point, yeah, probably the Tsar is also thinking of expanding and conquering and crushing despite being in a weak position. Uh, I get the feeling they were just really ready for a good war by this point, and family relations and blood ties didn't yeah. actually mean that much. And we've talked a lot about the imperial mindsets. So there's almost this idea that you know, the, the war on the South Pole, that they're calling everything a war. There's a real war. It is a good point you make, though, that, that George, yeah, he was much more constrained in what he could do and his role in the war was much smaller and 
more insignificant than those of his cousins. He was basically there as like a, a figurehead, playing dress up, inspecting the troops, and mm -hmm. like giving little morale boosting speeches, but not actually involved in any of the day to day war management. No, which was left very much to the generals and to government. Whereas, yeah, the Kaiser and the Tsar, they were much more heavily involved in the actual actions of the war, and they were part of the decision-making process uh, in a way that, yeah, George never was. And it's interesting that both the Kaiser and, uh, and Nicholas, the Tsar, they don't make it after the war. The war puts an end to this kind of autocratic rulership. Whereas George V, who's got a much more modern uh, ro conception of royal, the monarchy, royal autocratic rulership, we should say, because um, obviously it doesn't put an end to autocratic rulership. In fact, yeah. Yeah. arguably, yeah. that's quite more crea creative. Yeah. Well, as, <laughs> as we go through the 20th century, we will see there are no end of autocrats. You're right for that caveat. Royal autocrats, uh, they tend to be ending at this point. Like this is the last hurrah, I would say, of the royal autocrats, the build up to World War One. And then World War I really puts paid for it once people see the devastation and the bloodshed that is caused as a result, really, of squabbles uh, of this aristocratic class. And they are yeah, leading their citizens to death. They had a chance to avoid it. They could have done more, uh, but, yeah, didn't. And as a result of their meddling and their, and their politics and their demand for, for more territories and empire uh it causes world war one and, and they're rightly i think uh, done away with afterwards maybe they're not entirely to blame but but uh, they're a good scapegoat who, who is your favorite i i might slip this to you because you've well, got a much he, better knowledge of the royals right. who is your favorite royal around this time through these sort of three generations you mean yeah let's say from victoria onwards who is who is your favorite royal <laughs> got it slim pickings um, favourites really hard. Okay, so favourites going to be King Edward the Seventh, right? Even though he was kind of pretty awful in his own way and treated women really badly, I like. Is this dirty bird? Yeah, I like his underdog story of being kind of seen as someone who had been completely useless, couldn't live up to his father's intellectual reputation, um, had a very difficult upbringing, and then sort of saw ten years of relative feasts and stability that's not true actually that is a myth the stability because we know all these forces are, are bursting up um but the fact that he was only there for 10 years and gets his own age edwardian age is quite um quite says it all and um i like yeah so i think he's my favorite because there's all this he, it's mostly because he's overlooked and he's got like quite an interesting story but i find it hard to pick a favorite especially looking at this lot on the screen um prince albert i would say is the best one and his early death pro probably really affected the course of stuff but if, if you see him if you like as the kind of grand project master and then he dies just uh, halfway through the project leaving victoria who speaking of gender dynamics albert's very much taken over the idea that he's the the king you know, the king of the brain, and Victoria's sort of the little woman, uh, as it were. So she, as we've discussed in early episodes, is a bit uh, lost when he dies. And if you think about it, all these all these figures in this family will have been at family occasions at great-grandma Victoria's, where they've all had to, like, sit around the bust of Albert and sort of endure the slightly strange shrine elements. So they've all been brought up groomed to worship Albert and as we see that does not have necessarily the consequences intended. Families, eh? Um, but I'll tell you what, just, if you just pick out something and ask me for a fact. I can pick any royal family member and ask you for a fact. Yeah, or, I don't know, yeah, whatever, something like that. Okay. Uh, can you give me a fact about Dagmar of Denmark, um, married to the uh, to to Tsar Alexander the Third of Russia. You know what, Johnny? Nicholas's mother, Dagmar. I don't. Of Denmark. I don't think I'd really even heard of Dagmar of Denmark until today. So I can't give you a fact on that. Her. 
Okay. Um, can we, All right. can, we get, let's, about... can we keep it a bit more British would, would be good, or at least to the very main players? Because <laughs> I, 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 okay. I don't know about Dagmar. If okay, you don't know about Dagmar. Well, narrow it down. Nicholas Witchell would Britain. know. <laughs> Give me a fact about, uh, about King George V's brother who died tragically. The would-be king. The king who was meant to be but never was. I'm interested to know a bit more about him. Prince Albert Victor uh, seemed to be... Um, he, he was seen as a bit of a, an, an idiot. Uh, um, involved or... I say involved. They were really covered up quite a bit at the time. Nearly involved in sex scandals which isn't unusual for the family, except that his, potentially there were like homosexual liaisons as well, which you, um, which, which is sort of interesting for the time. And it's his involvement with that affair or alleged involvement with the Cleveland Street, Cleveland Street affair um, that led to the sort of late 20th century absurd tyings of him to the Jack the Ripper uh, killings. So that's where all the like from hell and silliness in my view, so conspiratorial stuff comes out of that. So that's how they connect him with the sort of um, underworld, if if you like. Um, yes, he was, I think, quite he quite ill throughout his life, and um, as we said, died of flu. Uh, his he was known. His name was Eddie. So don't forget here we've got Albert, who was Albert. Then we've got Bertie, who became King Edward. His then he had Albert Albert Victor who was known as Eddie, then Eddie aka Albert Victor's younger brother George became George who had David and Bertie. David became Edward but then abdicated. It's still making my head spin. And then Bertie became King K- K- George the Sixth or Colin Firth if you like. So we should we start again, Johnny? So repeat it after me. Albert had. Albert, who was Bertie, became Edward. Albert was... Son was Albert. No, 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 no. Who was then Bertie and became Edward. Albert had Albert, who was Bertie, who became Edward. That's right. Edward had Albert, a.k.a. Eddie and George, who became King George. King George had David... And Bertie, who became King Edward and King George the Sixth. King George the Sixth had Elizabeth and Margaret. Elizabeth and Margaret love our Queen. Do you do you understand? I zoned out. Sorry. <laughs> yes, more or less, I understand. It's a convoluted, complicated family tree, and they've all got different. Names I made it more complicated. That, that's true. Yeah. Everyone's favorite's the QE2. This queen's so strong, it isn't fighting. She's the longest rating. Nation's money. She's over the 